Hi everyone, welcome back to another Peacock Review. Today I'm here to talk about A Song of Ice and Fire, Starks vs. Lannisters, Starter Set. This is a new war game, miniatures game, tabletop miniatures game, from Cool Mini or Not. It's now just gone to backers and review copies are out. It's going to be in stores August 31st, according to Simon. Now, this is just the Starks and Lannisters starter set. Typical to, um, say, a starter set of X-Wing. You get a couple of ships, and then the idea is to expand your army. This is one type of one of those types of games. You might be happy with everything that's in the starter set. Now, we're talking 103 miniatures. Without a further word of ado, let me jump in and show you how this baby plays, and then I will give you my thoughts on everything. Some of the stuff I am showing off are maybe Kickstarter items, maybe Kickstarter exclusives, maybe add-ons or expansions. I will try and explain, I will explain everything that just comes in the retail version and I'll try and highlight what is uh, blinged out Kickstarter as opposed to what the regular version is. Let's go down to the table, talk about how it plays and then we'll come back with my thoughts. Okay, so I've kind of skipped ahead of the setup, which is part of the game and offers some of the overarching strategy, how you're going to play. Depending on which game mode you're going to choose, you're going to be able to set up either 6 inches or 12 inches from the edge, short or long range, respectively. So the first thing that's going to happen is we're going to each take turns placing a piece of terrain. Nothing can be within 6 inches of a deployment edge or another piece of terrain. And this one game mode I'm set up is called Feast for Crows. There's going to be two of these corpse piles that start the game. It's not a terribly complex game to explain. In fact, the rules of the game are pretty much on these cards right here. Double-sided cards. Tells you everything your units can do, what the three different conditions would do if they're on you. Tells you your orders, attack bonuses, disorderly charge, surge forth. Through dice rolls, you're going to determine who's placing terrain first, and then you're going to determine who goes first, and then the other player gets to choose which side of the battlefield after all the terrain's been set up. And then the players are going to field their armies one unit at a time going back and forth. Now, the armies that you use is also part of the game. You're going to army build beforehand. Now, I've got a 40-point game set up because I got extra expansion units, and these will be released later, of course. So you've got your combat units, which is everyone on the board, and then you have your non-combat units down here. These are represented by uh, NCUs, they call them like Cersei over here, or Sansa Stark. Now this board here has a spot for five non-combat units to be played over the course of a round. A round is everybody activating everything they have once, and then the next round would start. Once you take a spot on the board, that character stays there till the till the end and you would get one of the five bonus. You can force someone to make a panic test, you can heal a unit up to three wounds, you can draw two tactics cards, a friend the unit can make a free attack, and a friend the unit can make a free maneuver. In addition to putting a non-combat unit on this board, they're gonna have a card that you will attach to the unit. So Cersei, for example, no confidence is the ability. Um, so influence means when you claim the tactic zone, you're going to attach this to a combat unit until the end of the round. And that unit's going to suffer minus two to morale test. That's a huge negative. So Cersei is working behind the scenes. She's going to do something to impact the morale of the unit she attaches herself to. And there's a lot of cards that are going to give you certain bonuses based on which tactic zone um, area you control. I'll explain those a little more when I get into the tactics cards. So how do you play? Going back to this card, it shows you your different uh, options. You can do a maneuver. A maneuver is you take a unit, you can pivot it any direction you want. You can freely move it around the center. You can move whatever their mood value is. The Stark Sworn Swords movement value is 5, the boot on the top left corner of the card. So 5 inches. Put them at the 5, you move them straight ahead till they get the 0. Move them up to 5, and then you can freely pivot them again. 
So that would be a maneuver. Now a march action is similar. They can go straight ahead, double their movement. So these guys could go 10. You're not allowed to pivot beforehand. You go straight ahead and then you can pivot and face any direction you want. Your next action is a charge and that's the only way to come into melee contact with another unit. So let me just move this corpse pile out of the way for simplicity. Now it's worth noting that this 3D terrain I have on the board is blinged out extras. The trees that come with the game would be cardboard trees like that. So charging, you're allowed to pre-measure beforehand. So just say if my Lannister swordsman wanted to charge those, or sorry, uh, Stark Sworn Swords wanted to charge the Lannister swordsman. Their movement is five. So you're always rolling one dice and adding it to your base move value when you do a charge. So their move is five. A five would be 10. That means I'm easily into contact with that unit. Boom. And then once I connect, I can choose to either line it up halfway like that or completely like that. Or of course over there, you can choose where you shift. You're always fully connected or half connected. Um, the reason for doing this is maybe I wanna make room for another unit to come in. And if you just happen to hit a unit like that, you always snap them in together. So they're connected like that. Now, if I roll the one, just say I was only that far away, I'm well within one move. You still have to roll a dice. So if I roll a one, that's called a disorderly charge. It means you still charge in, but the usual benefit of charging is you get to reroll all your misses on your attack. If you suffer disorderly charge, you lose that benefit and you don't get to play any tactic cards to help you out. The next action on the board is the attack. If you're already connected in melee combat, you would roll your attack dice. So going back to the Sworn Swords, right now they have three, they're full rank, so they will roll that eight. If they lose the last guy in their back rank, then they're rolling six dice. And if they only have one rank left, they're rolling five dice. So the more beat up they get, the less dice they get. It doesn't matter if you only have one unit in a rank, it's still considered a full rank. So combat is very straightforward. There's lots of things that can modify things, but they need a four plus on however many dice it tells them to roll. So full rank, rolling eight dice, all fours plus are, hit or, are hits. So if I successfully charge, these are misses. I know I'm not rolling all eight dice, but I'm just giving you an example here. All the, so the reroll would have helped immensely. Soon as you calculate your hits, the defender is gonna roll defense. So looking back at the card here, you look at the shield on the bottom left corner, fours pluses. However many hits gone through, so say four hits went through and there were four misses, they're gonna save on four plus. So I saved three, I lost one. You're gonna peel a guy off the back right. That represents the casualty. And then anytime you're attacked, you're gonna make a panic test. That's the flag symbol in the bottom right there in yellow. Six plus is what you need on two dice. For every number you fail by, it's gonna be, uh, the difference is gonna be a casualty. So I'm rolling there a four, their morale is six plus. I'm losing two extra dudes. Now there's also ranged combat, which of course you don't have to be into contact with. But if you look at a, a ranged unit like the Stark Bowman here, they will have that extra bow symbol. Same thing, right? They're gonna get, um, well, it shoots long range, so it can go 12 away. And um, yeah, they, they roll better dice when they're shooting arrows than if they're in hand-to-hand -hand combat. The final thing you can do is a retreat action. If you're already connected to a unit, you can move either straight back your move or one side or the other. Um, it's gonna be your move plus a D6 as if you charge. And then when you're done, you can pivot. One thing I like about this above, say Warhammer, Fantasy is that it's easy to break out of combat if you have to. You're not like locked into a fight the whole game. There's lots of maneuverability to get into better positions. I mentioned conditions. There's gonna be certain effects of cards that can cause someone to become panicked, vulnerable, or weakened. And they're all basically, if that unit was panicked, for example, from a, um, a game effect, either from an order or a tactics card or a unit's ability. 
But if they were panicked, I can choose to remove the panic token off my enemy unit and force them to re-roll their morale dice. You've got vulnerable, which forces them to re-roll their defense dice, and weakened, which makes them re-roll attack dice. It keeps it nice and simple. There's three different effects that can happen to your dudes based on game effects. We're gonna talk about orders next. Some units will have an order they can do, and you'll put a token on it to show that it's been used, but every order can be used once around. So these Stark Outriders here, after this unit has attacked with melee, it can make a free retreat action. So I would just put a little order token on top of this to show that I've used it. And the last part we need to touch on is attack bonuses. If you hit someone from the side or the rear, not only do they get minus on their defense save, minus one to the side, minus two to the back, but they also lose that on their morale roll as well. If you're in combat, before you do your attack, you can freely change positions. So just say there was someone on that, like you can shift first. So I could slide over that way, or if these guys were being hit on the side, they're gonna be able to spin around and face them when they do their next attack. You're going to, players are gonna go back and forth doing one of their available actions and putting a little order token on the unit to show they've gone. These are, these are Kickstarter bling items. They're just cardboard tokens that come with the game. You put them on the back. And depending on the size of the army you're playing with, like for a small army, 30 points, it's gonna be whoever gets eight victory points. Now by default, anytime you destroy a unit, you're always gonna get one victory point. As long as that unit costs at least one. So some of the free units you get aren't gonna offer victory points. And then depending on the game mode you play, you're gonna get victory points for other reasons. Like a Game of Thrones, there's gonna be five objectives out there. Holding these objectives are gonna give you victory points. And then if you meet other certain conditions, you can get bonus victory points on top of that. You're automatically gonna win if you destroy the whole enemy's force. Um, terrain is gonna impact things differently, like this tree over here will give a bonus. It's an inspirational tree. It's gonna give bonus to morale checks. These corpse piles are gonna give negatives and they're gonna slow people down if they're running through them. The, the forest over here is gonna offer cover and it's gonna slow people down if they run through them. And this thing here is just a uh, impenetrable barrier that blocks line of sight and movement. Line of sight is pretty easy. Um, you, if you're going through another unit, line of sight's blocked. Um, and you go from the center arrow, there's uh, arc markers on each side, so that would be all within the front arc. If I was shooting at the unit and that tree was there, then, because uh, you, you go from center of arrow to center of arrow, then that unit would have cover. But if the tree is a little bit over that way, um, just even though it's in my front arc, I'm not going through it going center arrow to center arrow. The last thing to talk about are the deck of tactics cards. Every faction, whether you're the Boltons, the Lannisters, or the Starks, or the Free People, you're gonna get your own 14 card deck that's the same every time you play that faction. They're gonna have the symbol there. Uh, so that's gonna be seven different cards with two copies each. And then whoever you pick as your commander, so Brendan Tully in this, is gonna give you six other cards. That's three unique cards of two copies each. So your commander is gonna give you special abilities based on his power. And these tactics cards really amp up the game. I think the Starks have superior combat power, but the Lannisters have way better tactics cards. All the tactics cards will tell you the triggers at the top and then what the power does. When you have something like this, if you control that, they're talking about the tactics guards, uh, the tactics board. So if you send a non-combat unit to the combat part of the tactics board, you're gonna get the extra bonus. Okay, so that's how the game plays. Now, I know it's a miniatures game, but it very much plays like a board game. It's got the simplicity of a board game feel. So let's talk about the mechanics of the game. Now, the, the D6 straight up, I roll this much to hit, you roll this much to save, might come across as a turnoff to people looking for more meat in a miniatures game. It's something that I find is good about the game because it makes it so accessible. All the rules of the game are on one double-sided card and then all the little complexities are added based on your powers, who your commander is, the cards they add to your deck. 
which attachments you add to your army. So for me, having that nice simple combat, I think it just takes out any um, bulk or unnecessary steps to get right into the action. And I think it was a good decision for them to do that. As far as accessibility goes, I, I wouldn't have a hope of uh, getting my wife involved in Warhammer 40k, or probably even Star Wars Legion. But this game, you've got a, um, an IP that we're both in love with, we're big fans of the yeah. show. I can explain the rules to her in five minutes, so for that reason alone, that's why I chose this game as my Lifestyles Miniatures game that I wanted to get into and expand. So I'm going to come right out and say the accessibility of this game as a miniatures game is one of the best things it has going for it because people that are big Games of Thrones fans can really take a liking to this quickly. As far as the rank and file miniatures in a tray, typically it's not my type of game. I'm not a big fan of moving around trays. I used to play a lot of Warhammer back in the day. My, my father still owns a brick and mortar friendly local game store for the last 30 years. Warhammer and 40k and miniatures game was a big part of my life before I left the nest. So I do have experience with some of these rank and files and um, a game like Rune Wars I felt that the the movement of the trays was so restrictive that it took away the fun of the game. I absolutely love the freedom you have to move your trays around so it doesn't feel like um, a, a bulky rank and file game. It feels like you're You've got a lot of control over what your army can do. If you want to reverse away from a fight, you can. You can you can move completely sideways or completely backwards. Um, you can do a full 360, walk backwards, and spin around again. So I love the freedom of movement that the trays have. And once you come into contact, the trays snap together. You can choose which side to go on um, to bring in another unit from the back. So again, a huge plus on how easy it is to enact your grand plans, your, your battlefield tactics. So hats off to that move. Everything's definitely coming together in a nice package. You have the non-combat units and the tactics board we talked about during the gameplay. That is something that I just love about this game. You don't have it in any other miniatures game. To have Cersei um, claim a spot on the board that's going to give you a bonus, and then she's going to get attached to a unit, either an enemy unit if it's a negative effect, or a friendly unit if it's a positive effect. And that ability that she does is going to be very thematic with the character from the book. So we're going to jump into that. Um, one of my favorite things about the design of the game and integrating it with Game of Thrones is that if you're familiar with these characters, their powers are going to feel like who they are, like Jamie Lannister. You can use a Jamie Lannister who's got his arm cut off and he's a prisoner. So at the beginning of the game, you're attaching him to an enemy unit. And that unit's going to be worth more victory points if it gets killed. And um, you've got the Mountain, this guy. You can use him either as a commander of your army or as an attachment. You've got a Mounted uh, Mountain who might be Kickstarter exclusive, I'm not sure. So if, uh, if you're disappointed that you might not get your hands on it, I'm sorry for that. But um, he's such a destroyer that anytime he's rolling to attack, he's doing automatic kills no matter what. And that just reflects his huge strength. So the um, I get brought into who the characters are. And this goes leaps and bounds better for people that are into the IP because they know these characters and their powers feel like those characters won't make a huge difference for someone that is just playing this as a straight up miniatures game and someone that isn't familiar or a fan of the IP playing it as a, just a miniatures game I think they're still going to have a really good time but they might not be grabbed by it as much as someone who is a fan of the IP the mechanics of the game themselves make this a really fun game whether you're into the theme or not but if you're into it you're gonna you're gonna get a lot of love from what all the characters do. I feel Eric Lang's influence all over this. The way you can combo the tactic cards with the um, attachments on your units really gives me a CCG kind of vibe because you can put together these great combos. Another big highlight of the game is the five different game modes. Yeah, I had this game set up for over a week when I got it 
and I've been obsessed with it. It's barely left being set up off the table. And I've had a chance to play four of the five game modes. I've played a few of them a couple of times. You've got the Feast of Crows, which is the more of the straight up combat one. You start with these uh, pile of bodies on the, or corpse piles on the battlefield, and anytime you're within six inches or close range, then you are subtracting one from your morale test. Anytime a unit is killed, they get replaced with a corpse pile. If you, oh, if you start your turn near one as well, then you're rolling a morale test, and if you fail, you're adding a victory point to your guy, to, uh, which would make them worth one more to the enemy when they get killed. Uh, you've got the siege one, where the attacker gets unlimited, he can keep replenishing his units, and the defender has uh, three lengths of castle walls here, with six hit points each, and they only have their finite, uh, finite amount of units that they spend their points on. So they have to just hold out for six rounds to win the game. You've got a couple of them that have objective markers and you get certain abilities or buffs while you're holding those objective markers. Again, it comes into the comboing with your non-combat units and your commander and your tactics cards and your attachments. So going for particular objectives, there'll be a, a random card per objective, so they're not always going to be the same every game, and you're going to be more incentivized to go for certain ones. Variable setup with different terrains doing different things. I mean, there's um, you, when you're setting up, you can pick absolutely anything you want, and you can use those to your advantage, and the tactical decisions you have to make based on the terrain can really be interesting. And I found the rule book to be very well written, and it uses great examples that eliminate any question I would have had. As far as how it scales with uh, three or four players, it's, it's great because of the accessible rules that it's just a ton of fun. It's kind of like Memoir 44 is a two-player game, but if you want to play six players, you can have an epic, awesome Memoir 44 game. So having huge, epic battles, maybe playing on an 8x4, which I've got uh, set up ready to go for this weekend, you can have some crazy battles. Uh, the components, the minis are amazing. The, uh, the rest of the stuff is okay. The cards are, they're fine. Uh, linen finish would have been mwah. Um, thick cardboard for the, the castle walls. Uh, the train is all just two-dimensional pieces of that. And it's actually more, um, like, I, I have to use the 2D stuff because if a unit's going to move over top of it, like the trees, I sometimes you got to move the 3D piece and I put the 2D representation on. So it's actually easier just to use the cardboard pieces anyway. You don't necessarily have to bling it up with all the 3D stuff. And you can get any sort of stuff to represent whatever. Let's segue into some of the more negative things about this game. 30 point army, a 30 point army is a small game. A 40 point army is a big game and a uh, medium game. And a 50 point army is a large game. Like 103 figures in here, but you can still only play a small game unless you buy more miniatures. But this is a game where that is pretty much built into um, being a necessity. Yes, you can play a 30 point game out of the box. You can play 10 games, 20 games, and still have fun. But for a lot of people, they're gonna want to start customizing their own armies. They're gonna, gonna start coming up with great combinations of characters on their own. And let's not forget, you have a neutral army that can be used on any side. So that really changes how things can combo around as well. So the game is going to be expensive. It's probably $150 for the starter set, and then you're going to get one squad of troops. A unit of four horses would be $30, $35. A unit of 12 swordsmen, probably $13. It'll probably have a swordsman captain in it, and then 12 other guys. $30, $35, so if you wanted to get everything for this game, you can expect to spend a lot of money. If you just have the one force that you want to customize and make better, it's not going to be so bad, especially compared to other miniatures games like Warhammer, Warhammer 40k. Pound for pound, getting into this one compared to Star Wars Legion, 
I think is going to be a much better deal. Conversely, there's, good, there's already been two new factions announced coming out around November, the Free Folk, which they're showing off at, at Gen Con, and they're going to have like giants and uh, siege weapons, and then you've got the Night's Watch, so I'm excited. I'm excited to get into this one. This is the one I chose, and I probably could have just made back everything I spent on the Kickstarter. Um, if it wasn't my thing, but this is the one I'm jumping on board. I'm glad I didn't go for Star Wars Legion. I'm glad I've stayed away from uh, Age of Sigmar. This is accessible enough to get into with my wife and have a rivalry, so it's a big winner for me. Another benefit about the game is the playtime. This isn't... Now, it could be, I suppose, but it, it clocks in between 90 minutes and 2 hours, I think, for a 40-point game, a medium-sized game. Uh, and you can probably knock a half hour easy off that for a small game. Now, I mentioned the mat is a 4x4 area. That could be a huge problem because not everybody has a 4x4 table. So, you might have to play on what you have, and that could throw off a little bit of the balance of the game because you, get, you start a certain distance from the edge of the board based on the game mode, either within 6 of your edge or 12. If you're playing on a 3x3 table or a round table, Everybody's, everybody's going to be closer together, and I'm not sure what that's going to do to how the game was designed. Because now everybody's a whole lot closer to everything, turn one. Uh, let me know in the comments below if you have been playing on a modified table surface. I'm really interested to know. So, uh, there you have it. That's a Song of Ice and Fire. My thoughts are mostly positive. So, uh, very happy with my purchase. If you want to hear more about this, check out the Peacock Podcast on YouTube where I'm always talking about what I'm playing and I have a topic of the week. I'll be talking about this one a lot more, the different game modes. And if anyone has any questions about this game at all, ask in the comments below and I will do my best to answer you. Again, thanks so much for watching. You can check me out on the old Twitter right here and Peacock Podcast on YouTube. See you next time.